so that you would know what your pastor is planning. So the sermon title of the sermon today is Get Out of the Way of God. <coughs> Are you standing in God's way? What does that even mean? Some might say that walking in God's way means choosing behaviors that are pleasing to God, developing a relationship with him. These kinds of walking with God things can include delighting in him, meditating on his word, discovering his will, walking by faith, not by sight, bearing fruit in all our good works. These are all good and righteous behaviors. But I say say there's one more behavior that keeps us walking in the path of God instead of blocking that path for others being an obstacle in the kingdom we must remember that everyone even non-believers even people that are completely looking different than us like our singers today we must remember that everyone is a child of God and we must accept them and do what we can to show them that by living as a Christian is the way to love health and eternal life This is the message of today's scripture (coughs) and my message to you today. We must set aside any deep-seated, unchristian inclinations we have because of the culture into which we were born and seek to include everyone in our day-to-day experiences, perhaps even striving to make a friend of someone we may think of as a foe or an outsider. If we do not recognize all people as children of God, even criminals, we are standing in the way of God's grace. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm so sorry. We see advice from the Apostle Paul who wrote to the people of Caesarea, of Colossae and, uh, and Corinthians, the Corinthians, Reminding them that before we can bring someone to the Lord, we should try to make that person a friend. (coughs) We do that by generating proper speech. We communicate words that are profitable, words that speak truths, words that encourage. If we are making negative remarks, thinking negative thoughts, whispering insensitive jokes, or acting standoffish, We are not approaching a relationship such as we would when our conversation is full of grace, seasoned with salt, when it's pure and mature. And when it is, we are acting wise toward outsiders. This is getting out of God's way. (coughs) This is going to be a challenging sermon. (coughs) Secondly, we stay out of the way of God by walking the talk. In his letter to the church at Philippi, Paul instructs his flock to live joyfully in every circumstance and follow his example in whatever they heard or saw displayed in him. Would we be able to make such a bold claim to a fellow fellow believer? (coughs) He told the Corinthians the same thing. I urge you to imitate me. Paul was able to challenge these people to imitate him because he was following the example of Christ. Follow my example as I follow the examples of Christ, he told them. Paul was following the example of walking the talk that Jesus had displayed in his own life. Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he lived the truth. He is the truth. (coughs) He didn't just tell his disciples to wash one another's feet. He set the example by doing it first. He didn't just tell people he was gentle and humble. He showed that he was. Paul lined himself up with the example of Jesus and could tell the Corinthians, follow my example as I follow the example set forth by Jesus himself. This doesn't mean Paul did it perfectly. (coughs) But he showed himself to be a follower of Christ and we need to do the same. We need to live the gospel, not only for ourselves, but to be examples to others of the value of following Jesus' way. Let us not contort the gospel's message to fit our lives. Let us contort our lives to fit the gospel message. 
Now, remembering that some people, excuse me, are more apt to respond to the gospel, not when they hear it, but when they see it, is a wise move. What this means is that our actions speak louder than our words. For just as the experience of the Holy Spirit transformed Peter's small community of believers into the church at the beginning of the Acts, the presence of the Spirit's work among the outsiders, the ones who were not a part of God's covenant of Moses, known by many names, these outsiders were called Gentiles, pretty much anybody who was a non-Jew, Samaritans, for those of a lower sort of despised stature, and others. This demonstrates that they too are part of the church, whether liked or despised by their neighbors. This is not what many of the early Jewish Christians experienced, and questions about inclusion of outsiders consumed the early life of the church. Being an outsider is always a tough road to hope. Can any of you remember what it was like for you when you started over, either in a new school, a new city, or a new job away from home? You probably sensed you had to prove yourself to those already present. You may have been a little shy. I've been there, and I'm sure so have you. For some, making new friends is Easy and merging into the lifestyle of a new place is not a challenge at all. But for others, especially in this day and age, it's more of a challenge. It's hard to be new. So while we were in Europe recently, <coughs> Bob and I were the outsiders. And we were looked at curiously by some we met. And it seemed obvious to us that everybody who was looking at us knew we were completely American. <laughs> I wondered if they were preconceived to think of us as self-righteous, rich, pompous, know-it-alls. What actions did we take to show our true selves to them, to counteract what they may have thought of us as Americans? For me, my Christianity was being worn on my sleeve and around my neck. I wore my cross most of the time. And even while doing so, I was aware I, struck, I stuck out like a sore thumb. For seeing someone profess their Christian faith in Europe is rare. Europe is on a rapid decline in terms of believers, even though Christianity is still the largest religion in Europe and played a significant role in the development of European culture and identity. Now, though, the percentage of Christians in Europe has declined significantly. So being on the outside as we were for two weeks, though, does not mean that there was no thread of similarities, no commonalities, no shared experiences, for we are all human beings. What seems to be separating people today, from my perspective, is that face-to-face, one-on-one human interaction, finding what is common between us and building from there. <coughs> Such building openly hearing each other, speaking to and considering the other person, listening to them, while rejecting our own preconceived notions of what their life must be like, always leads to a different outcome than might have been expected, just like it was for the first century Christians. Those who do not believe that Jesus is mankind's Savior will never be convinced he is. If we do not find a link to our mutually shared needs and develop even a surface relationship. Creating relationships with unbelievers is critical. And so I reject my upbringing's teaching, don't talk to strangers. Instead, we must talk to strangers. We must approach them and embrace them. And we'll be surprised by what happens. In my and Bob's case, over the past two weeks, one link with people we met happened to be baseball. And we were able to spend some time with parents of the other boys on Wes's team. And there weren't many Americans among them. Most were from the Czech Republic or elsewhere. <coughs> Thinking back to those experiences in particular, I witnessed the repeated prayers of one of the pitchers on Wes's team. The mark of Boilermakers, they're called. His name was Angel Vilches. Imagine 
how me sitting there in the midst of all of these, you know, atheists probably watching baseball, and up on the mound comes this young man with a cross around his neck who stands on the mound and prays. Angel was from Colombia. In the seemingly godless land of Europe, when I see someone who wears a cross and praying publicly while standing on a baseball pitching mound of all places, I can't help but gravitate toward them. And the 33-year-old pitcher and I had a nice chat after the game. The team lost, but his pitching was very good. And I talked to him about his Christianity. He gives God all the credit for any talent he has, he said. And we had a nice chat. Which brings me to my final point. Getting out of God's way by reaching out to others so that the kingdom can grow. Now, I reached out to someone who I already knew was a Christian. But there was a lot of other reaching out that went along <clears throat> over the two weeks. And while I was in Europe, I stumbled across a YouTube channel called The Yes Theory. The Yes Theory. Their mantra is this. Life's greatest moments and deepest connections exist outside of your comfort zone. Life's greatest moments and deepest connections exist outside your comfort zone. So say yes to seeking discomfort because that is why we shy away from those who seemingly don't fit into our day-to-day -day lives. We feel a little uncomfortable around people that are different. It got me to thinking how my comfort zone excludes certain types of people, maybe certain nationalities, that I always seem to turn away from. It's unconscious, and I don't even really know why. But why isn't as important as recognizing this discomfort zone, that thing, or those people we shy away from, and maybe even pretend don't exist or don't matter. We just walk right past them. The yes theory's response to that is setting an example for us by always engaging in new projects that stretch what brings them comfort. I watched several of their videos and I learned that I have to find my discomfort zone and seek to live in it. And this is biblical, my friends. It's what Peter did, despite the criticism from the ruling Jews. He dined with the Gentile centurion and they got all over him on it. I know what those places are for me. Do you know what your discomfort zones are? Finally, <coughs> let me share another story with you that I read while in Europe. And I feel a kinship with those of you coughing out there. <coughs> in 1981, a hundred long, hundred foot long tugboat named Michael lumbered along at the slow speed of three knots towing a barge named Gabriella, which was loaded with one million Chinese Bibles. By 9 p.m. on that night, June 18, 18, 1981, this was in 1981, the tugboat Michael and its crew of 20 had, in the darkness, weaved through a maze of Chinese Navy ships near the port city of Shantou in southern China. Thousands of local Christians waited patiently in the darkness on the appointed beach with small rubber bolts to move the Bibles from Michael to them. Believers came out into the water, some up to their neck, and they pulled the boxes full of Bibles onto the beach, cutting them open with shears and passing them around. One million Bibles were moved that day. It took two hours in the dark. These Chinese promised to circulate the Bibles across the entire country. In some cases, that process took as much as five years, and many Chinese Christians paid dearly for it. Over the past 30 years, documented story after story, often from unusual places and situations, stories circulated of the impact of those Bibles have been shared. The effort was called Project Pearl Bibles and has left its mark in virtually every province of China. On the final leg of our journey home, 
having arrived at the giant airport in Zurich. We came by train from Lucerne. After our booked train was suddenly canceled, Bob and I had to wildly find another one to Zurich amongst the thousand other people that got shoved off that train. What a frightening time, <laughs> being in somewhere where we didn't speak the language and, and having everything all planned out and knowing how to get to the airport, and then suddenly it's like, whoops, never mind, train doesn't work, get another one. Well, when we finally accomplished what we needed to get accomplished, found a train and made our way to Zurich, we walked around the airport at 7 p.m. at night trying to find food and find our bearings so that we could determine how to get to our terminal for our 9 a.m. flight. It was an early flight and we had to go through security uh, so we really had to get started around 7.30 in the morning. Bob was okay, but I was exhausted and getting sicker by the minute. I happened to notice through our wandering a big illuminated sign up on one wall that said this, what have you done for humanity today? Survive, I thought to myself. We were moving pretty quickly and so I didn't catch the organization's name across the bottom, but it made sense that such a sign would be prominently placed on the walls of one of the larger airports in the world in a country well known, Switzerland, for its international and neutral efforts to find peaceful conflict resolution between warring countries. Switzerland has always been on the forefront of restoring grace to humanity and is internationally respected and trusted as a competent, reliable, neutral country that is often the meeting ground for international healing. I love Switzerland. It's where the American Red Cross started. The International Red Cross started by Henri Dumont. I worked for the Red Cross for five years, and its its humanitarian um, economy is is it sort of permeates everything. So I pondered to myself as I stumbled and coughed my way past that sign through the airport in search of a salad. What have I done for humanity today? At that time, I couldn't hardly think straight, but I knew I had to preserve that question for later. It is a question we must all ask ourselves, my friends, as we do our part to make the way straight for the Lord, to bring the kingdom to all persons, no matter their differences from us. I believe the most significant act we can accomplish to get out of God's way is accept everyone, everyone, as part of the kingdom, and do so with grace and openness. And remember that a stranger is just a friend we haven't met yet. Those words are from the yes theory. A stranger is just a friend we haven't met yet. In that way, many just may see our faith as the miracle it is. Maranatha, my friends, amen. Let us join together in a closing prayer. Lord, we admit to ourselves and to you that we have often enjoyed the privilege of being your people while avoiding the responsibility for making our spiritual discoveries known to others. We have given to professional people in the church the task that belongs to us all of telling the people in the street about Jesus. Help us to love you so much that with such great graciousness, we may begin to find opportunities to share what we know to those who desperately need it. Amen.